Well, it's an honor to be here today to worship with you and to open God's word with you at this amazing seminary, a place where the Bible is taken seriously and men or women are trained for gospel ministry. Dr. Moeller in his absence, uh, is thankful for this opportunity. Dr. Stinson, you did not do the best job of soothing me uh, for this task by bringing up Billy Graham and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, but just really glad to be here. So glad that my wife and my daughter could be here and some of the members of our church could be here as well. So I bring you greetings from the West End, which my wife says is the best end. And so... Um, if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. If you've arrived there, could you say Amen. If you need a minute, say, hold on, preacher. It's okay. I know it's it just, even though you're in seminary, it's okay to say you're having a problem getting to 2 Corinthians. Um, <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and it reads like this from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, you have given us the ministry that we have. And for that, we are thankful, Father. Father, help us not to lose heart in what we do. Help us to be faithful to the word. Help us to be humble, but ultimately help us to be motivated by the gospel which has changed our hearts, Father. Father, we pray now that as we come before, uh, as we come before this time of preaching, I pray that you will empower me, anoint me, pour your spirit out on me, cause your word to go forth with power and conviction and bring change and transformation in the hearts of your people, Father. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And I want to talk to you for just a few moments from the topic, ministers of the gospel. Ministers of the gospel the gospel. We live in a culture where Christianity has a rock starness about it, if that's a word, where, where, where Christianity is very popular and being a preacher is a very popular thing and, 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 and there's all these platforms and large crowds for many preachers. And you know, I don't think that's all bad. Thank God that God gives platforms to faithful men. But the truth is many platforms are, are being used by people who are not faithful. And it's no, it was no different in Paul's day. Paul, in a day, um, being a preacher of the gospel, dealt with those who had platforms amongst people who were not faithful. That's what's going on in the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul is writing his fourth letter to the Corinthians, the second one that we have in inspired scripture, and he's writing from Macedonia, and he's writing to the Corinthian church, a church that has all kinds of issues, is jacked up in many ways, and, and has many issues, and Paul is writing to them this second letter to them, a year after he wrote his first letter, having to defend his ministry. The, the, the Corinthians had gotten to the place where they no longer were validating the ministry of Paul. Possibly even some of them saw Paul's weaknesses as to show that he was not actually a minister of the gospel. And so Paul writes to the Corinthians in this second letter and throughout this second letter he deals with them and, and he talks about these opponents of his who he calls super apostles. 
Did these opponents that Paul, like I said, in his Pauline sarcasm calls super apostles, and, and, and he's writing to this church, dealing with them, and, and, and telling them how he is truly a minister of the gospel. And today in our very text, Paul lays out for us some realities of what a minister of the gospel is like. Paul contrasts himself with these false teachers who possibly are speaking of Paul in such a way that he's not really real, he's not really a minister of the gospel. And here in verses one through six, Paul lays out for us some things that are important to understand if we are going to be true ministers of the gospel. Now, I know a lot of us in this room are training for vocational ministry, and so this obviously applies very clearly to you. You're, you're, uh, you're going into vocational ministry, and, and, and so me talking about being a minister of the gospel makes a lot of sense. But there might be some of you here today that are saying, well, I'm not going into vocational ministry. My husband's in seminary. I just work here. And you might think, well, how does this relate to me? Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, everybody is a minister of the gospel. And as a matter of fact, if you are training for vocational ministry and you're not acting as a minister of the gospel now, I don't think you'll act like it when you get in vocational ministry. That's a sermon for another day, though. Um, so what I want to do is I want to walk through this text, and I want to show you at least four things that Paul shows us about being a minister of the gospel. Four things that are important for those who are going to be ministers of the gospel. Number one, if we're going to be ministers of the gospel, we must not lose heart in ministry. We must not lose heart in ministry. Look back at verse one with me, if you will. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercies of God, we do not lose heart. Paul says that we have this ministry. What ministry is it that Paul is talking about? Well, Paul is talking about the new covenant ministry, the gospel ministry which has been given to him, which he has just contrasted against the old covenant ministry in chapter 3 of this very book. Paul says that the ministry that he has is a new covenant ministry, a gospel ministry. And if you have any other ministry but a gospel ministry, then you have the wrong ministry. He says, we have this gospel ministry. And, and, and he says, though, notice, by the mercies of God. He doesn't say because he's so intellectual, though Paul was very intellectual. He doesn't say because he's been so good or because he deserves it. No, he recognizes that the ministry that he now has is only his because of a God in heaven who had mercy on him. And I don't know about you, but I think it's something that we really need to consider and think about because a lot of us think of ministry as a privilege that I'm supposed to have, I deserve this. No, no, no. If you're in ministry, it's only because of God's mercy in Christ. You have to come to a place where you recognize that because if not, you'll be a prideful fool. And he says, by the mercy of God, and he says, we don't lose heart. What? <laughs> we, we don't lose heart, Dr. Stinson. I don't know about you, but if anybody had the, 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 the opportunity to lose heart, it would be Paul. In this very same book, he, he, he says later on, the very chapter, verse 8 and 11, Paul lays out some of what he was facing in gospel ministry. Notice with me, verses 8 through 11, he says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Uh, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for, the, for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. If anybody had room to lose heart, it would be Paul. But Paul here in this text says that he doesn't lose heart. But why doesn't Paul lose heart? Because of the mercy of God. God has given Paul mercy. God has 
called Paul into the ministry. He has saved Paul, washed him of his sin, given him mercy, and therefore, because of that, he doesn't lose heart even in the midst of everything he's going through. Brothers and sisters, right now I know that you are going into vocational ministry or romanticizing about ministry and how great it's going to be when you get your first church or your first mission assignment or, or, or whatever it is. It's going to be so great. I'm going to be able to have this position. I'm going to write books and I'm going to have large Twitter followers and everything's just going to be great. Let me be honest with you. It's not always going to be like that. Matter of fact, for a lot of us, it'll never be like that. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um... It's going to be hard at times. Pastor, you're going to have people that come to you who you have discipled and cared for and shepherded, and they're going to come and say, you know, I'm leaving because I don't really like your preaching. You're going to have people that go, I don't like the direction we're going. We don't have enough children's ministry, or, or, or we, I don't like what's happening here, or, or you're going to have those difficult people who don't leave. They're not here today. I, 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 <laughs> But, 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 but the point is, it's not going to be a fairy tale. There's going to be times of struggle and persecution. And if you don't get to the place where you recognize the mercies of God in your life in Christ, you won't make it. You won't. Paul did not lose heart because he knew the one who called him and who was keeping him. And we must do that too, brothers and sisters. So not only the minister of the gospel, we must not lose heart, but notice number two, we must not water down the message. We must not water down the message. Walk with me in two through four, he says, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So Paul not only said he doesn't lose heart, but then Paul contrasts himself from the false teachers. He says, you know, we don't use underhanded ways to be about ministry. These guys are coming with their silvery tongues and all their gimmicks and all this stuff. That's not us. We're not using trickery. Brothers and sisters, Whatever you do to get people into your church, you're going to have to keep doing to keep them in your church. So let it be the pure preaching of God's word. Because that's something that you can control by God's spirit in you. If you give people $20 to come, you're going to have to keep giving people $20 to come. <laughs> and everybody's got a new gimmick. Everybody's got a new idea. Well, if we just did this or we just did that or we, or we did this little cool thing, we could trick them in. You can't trick people into the kingdom. Because they're not really in the kingdom if you trick them in. Notice, not only does he not use underhanded ways and, and, and trickery, but, but notice what, he, what also he, he goes on and he says, though. He says, we refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. This tampering, uh, I, I learned that, in, 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 um, that the Greek word for tamper was used in non-biblical sources to speak of the dishonest business practices of diluting wine with water. That people would actually take wine and put water in the wine for the purpose of getting more, wine, more in a bottle but less of their actual wine to trick people into buying it. And Paul's like in that same way, we're not out here watering down God's word to trick people in. You know, people go to, you know, your message really isn't all that relevant. You know, you got, you got to get the right stories and, and all that. And, 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 you know, if you don't, you know, and I'm, and I'm not against stories and illustrations and all these things. But, but, but what I'm saying is, is that there are people who have this desire and this, and, 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 to want to do things with the word of God in order to sneak people in. Well, you know, we really, you know, you kind of, we're not really going to deal with this, you know, you're living together, you're not married. You know, right, we'll just kind of let that go, you know, to get you on in so the, so the seats are full. You know, we're not going to really worry about, you know, your sexual orientation. We're not going to talk about any of that. You know, we'll just, yeah, just come on in. You know, these different ways of diluting down the gospel to the point where eventually there is no gospel left. 
And that's what's happened to a lot of churches. There's no gospel left. You diluted it so far that you can't even tell. That there's, you know, it's, it's like this cup of water. I can have a little red dot in it. And if there's just a little water in it, I can tell that it's thick red. But as I pour more and more water in it, it starts to become more and more faint. To where eventually you wouldn't even be able to tell there was a red dot of dye in it in the first place. That's what's happened with the Word of God in a lot of so-called churches. And you know, it's kind of interesting. I thought about this. I'm like, man, I'm sharing this at Southern Seminary. Nobody there is going to have this problem. Southern is just, you know, preaching the Word. Man, we're going to be true to the Word regardless. I'd be foolish not to think that there's not the possibility there could be people in this room right now who are thinking that I want to be liked so much, and I want to have such a big congregation or such a big following that, that, that I'm willing to let some things in the Word of God slide to the side so I can get some people in the door. Even though you're sitting here and learning how to exegete the text and deal with systematic theology and biblical theology, there, there will be a temptation for some. There have been many brothers and sisters who have walked through evangelical seminaries all this world that have fallen away from the truth of God's word. So how foolish would I be to think that that couldn't be the possibility even here? You know, these teachers are like, man, you know, Paul, you know, that, that, that word, it's not really going to affect anybody. It's too old. You know, Paul says, I didn't, I, I stayed with the truth. I committed myself to man's conscience. And why did Paul do that? Because he recognized the problem wasn't with his message, the problem was with the hearts of the people. Notice verses 3 and 4. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul understood that those who did not respond favorably to the message of the gospel were those who were blinded by Satan. In that him changing the message wouldn't help. It'd actually make it worse because then you start having people think they're in, but they're really not in. No, no, Paul recognized that he needed to be true to the word of God because at the end of the day, if anybody's heart was going to be unveiled, it was going to be by a miracle from a righteous God, a gracious God in heaven that removes the veil for them to receive the truth of the gospel. You know, they, we, we quote Grudem and Piper and Calvin and all this about Reformed theology. You know, if you, if you, you know how you know if your Reformed theology is really Reformed? When you can stand flat-footed and preach God's word and trust God with the results and not think that you have to do something to actually manipulate people into believing. That's how you know if you really believe in the doctrine of election and effectual calling and, and all these wonderful, beautiful doctrines. Paul, Paul got that. So he wasn't watering the message down. He was true to the message because he knew he couldn't trick anybody into the kingdom. They had to be born again by the power of God's spirit. So brothers and sisters, if we're going to be gospel ministers, we must not lose heart in ministry. Second, we must not water down the message of God's word. But thirdly, we must be humble. We must be humble. Notice verse 5. Paul says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. You guys ever heard the old uh, story of the preacher whose church gave him the award for being humble and they took it back when he started wearing it? <laughs> y'all ever heard that story? You know, the, the, the truth is, brothers, it's funny. The truth is we all struggle with pride. Raise your hand if you don't struggle with pride. See, I'm watching because if you raise your hand, it proves that you struggle with pride. But Paul says to them, we do not, notice he says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. In this celebrity culture of Christianity, there are many who are not proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord, but themselves. Do you, know, do you find in yourself a desire for much to be known of you? Do you, do you see that in your heart? Maybe, maybe some of you here have actually come to seminary because you thought if I become a pastor and get a church, then I'm going to write books and all this cool stuff will be known about me. That's your reason? No. You, you, there's not going to be any power in your ministry because there's no power in preaching you. 
Power's in preaching Christ as Lord. You know, people, we, 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 man, I just want a, a hundred more Twitter followers. And, man, I wish more people would read my blog. And, man, I want a book deal. And, man, why, why isn't this happening for me? You know, they even have things out there now that help you increase your platform. Like, that's crazy. Like, there are things out there, organizations that will work with you to actually increase your platform. And in not every case, but in many cases, it is your platform. You just want much to be known about you. And if that's you, to be honest with you, you're wasting your time taking all these hard Greek classes and, you know, taking church history and taking Dr. Gentry for the subtuagen of this. What, what, you're wasting, you, just go and be a TV personality somewhere. And you're wasting money, time, and, and mental energy. Because those who are true in the ministry are there because they want to see much made of Christ, not themselves. Notice not only does he say that he preaches Christ as Lord, but then notice the second half of verse 5. He, he, he goes on and he says, but, but just because the Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So not only does he recognize that, that, that it's his job to make much of Jesus, but also to be servants to them. And the word for servant here is the Greek word doulos, which means slave. Brother and sister, ministry is all about serving people. But, but these, these, these opponents of Paul's would have been those who would have wanted themselves served. There are people that love ministry because of the fact people serve them. You know, man, I know if I'm in ministry, people are going to serve me. They're going to do a lot of stuff for me. I remember what Paul's seeing here. There's nothing wrong with honoring people who do good gospel work, but I think we, we, we've in a lot of ways went towards worshiping. Went towards worshiping. And it's interesting that Jesus even says in Matthew 10, 45, that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So if Jesus, the only one who ever would deserve to be served by everybody, actually came to serve, what are we thinking, thinking that we should be served? It's foolishness. Once again, if you want to be served, uh, why, why you, I don't know why you're here reading all these books and doing all this. Go, go try your, your luck at being an actor or something in New York or something like that. Uh, you know, no, no. But the minister of the gospel is one who sees themselves as one who is serving. He's a slave to the people. His, his concern is for caring for the people. He's a humble person. He didn't walk in the room and expect everybody to gravitate to him or her. Let me move on. I'm probably stepping on some people a little bit. You're getting a lot uncomfortable. Um, let's see. Number four, if we're going to be ministers of the gospel, not only, number one, do we, not, must, we must not lose heart. Number two, we must not water down God's word. Number three, we must not be uh, we, must, we must be humble, but number four, we must be motivated by the gospel that saved us. Notice verse six, and we'll end it here with verse six. Verse six says, for God said, who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The, the, the Paul, now after he moves from talking about his humility of how he, he doesn't preach himself but Christ and, and then he talks about how he serves others and he says, for God who, let, uh, who said let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Such an interesting statement. Paul says that in the same way that God in creation spoke light into existence in the midst of darkness has actually allowed light to shine into the hearts of dead, darkened sinners. Yeah. That, that God who is the creator of the universe has made a new creation out of us. Through the gospel, through the power of God's spirit, he's shown this, uh, this, not this light uh, he has shown in us our heart, uh, in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is Paul's testimony that God had made him a new creation. 
He was on Damascus Road on his way to persecute Christians. And God stopped him where he was and created a new heart in him. And then his whole life from that point on was serving the God who saved him. And brother and sister, if you're going to do ministry effectively, you have to serve out of the, out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to serve out of the reality that I'm serving not to be saved, but because I'm saved. And the fact that God saved me has motivated me to want to see many, many, many more people saved and forgiven of their sins. And that's got to be your motivation. Because if your motivation is anything else, it's not going to stick. And can I be honest with my own self today in front of you? Like, I don't always minister out of this reality. And it's in those times when I don't minister out of this reality that I do want to lose heart. It's in those times, I'm sure that's when I want to lose heart. I'm sure it's in those times where, where, where I'm, I'm prideful. It's maybe even those times where I might be um, tempted to water down the word, possibly even. But if this is what I'm ministering out of, there's no room for pride in me. Because I recognize that it was Jesus that saved me. He reached out and grabbed a hold of me. Where's the room for pride? Why do I need to lose heart? The God of the universe who saved me is keeping me and sustaining me and building his church right now. Why do I have to tamper with God's word when it's God who by his spirit will save others the same way he saved me? But that's only able to be done if I'm ministering out of that reality. So some people are like, man, like, I feel you, TC. Like, man, that could be me too. So what, what do we do? Well, the reality is we have to be continuing to cultivate a heart that pursues God above all else. In those moments when we catch ourselves wanting to minister out of how bad we are, how big we are, we need to go back and remember the gospel. We need our brothers and sisters to remind us of this gospel, this truth that Christ has shown light in my heart. And that's got to be the only hope and the only reason why I do what I do for Jesus. So that's what we got to do, brothers and sisters. We got to remember that gospel. That gospel's just got to become so amazing to us. You know, we get to the place, I think, sometimes where I know it's about myself, where I don't think about the reality of what God did for me in Christ. You know, you, you get saved, you get in ministry, you start coming to seminary, you're like, yeah, look at me, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm doing this. And you're reading all the books and everything, but you've lost the wow of the reality that God has shown in your heart the knowledge of Christ. Am I the only one? And so daily, brothers and sisters, me and you and us, we have to continue to be wowed by that reality. We need to be reminded of what the Lord has brought us from. And let the gospel of Jesus Christ motivate the ministry that we do. Because without that, it will not, it will not be a powerful ministry. It will not be a ministry that honors Christ. So brothers, fight. Brothers and sisters, fight to remember that glorious gospel which changed your heart and minister out of that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you so much that you have shown the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ in our hearts. You've made new creations of us, Father. Help us to remember that daily, Father. And let that be the reason why we minister. Help it not to be because of people are showing up or because this ministry seems to be going good. No, let the reason we minister be because of the gospel and the gospel only, Father, that motivates us towards ministry, Father. We love you, we thank you, we honor you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.